when I was 17, the one thing that I wanted more than anything else in the world was my autonomy, was my freedom. And so I was pretty mad when my parents uprooted our lives from Richmond and decided in my grade 12 year to move us to Surrey. And so not only did we leave uh, the city that I knew, that I used to skateboard around and bus around, that I knew like the back of my head, not only did I leave my friends, not only did I leave my girlfriend behind, I was isolated in the city of Surrey, not knowing anybody, not knowing what I was going to do on the weekend, right? As a 12th grader, that's like the most important thing, the weekend, right? And, you know, all the experiences that come with uh, your 12th grade year, I felt like I was robbed of those experiences because, sure, we had a spare car and my parents allowed me at times to drive me and my sister to school during the weekdays. But the thing about it was when the weekend came around, my dad got a little like, you know, do I feel like giving Ben the car? Do I not? How much is gas right now? And so what I hated about it, it was that I was at his mercy when it came to being allowed to go and uh, uh, um, hang out with my friends. And this one weekend, this desire for autonomy and freedom came to head when my friends were doing something in Richmond at one of my buddy's house. And they asked me to come and I went downstairs and I asked my dad very kindly and politely if I could use the car to go on a Friday night down to hang out with my friends. And he just said, no. He's like, no, not, not this weekend. And the thing that drove me crazy was that he didn't give me a reason. You know, I thought to myself, maybe if he gave me a reason, I might have been at peace about it. But I went back up to my room. I called my friends. I said, like, hey, I'm not coming. Uh, why? Uh, I don't know. My dad's in a mood. You know, like, that's how I answered it. Uh, and as I talked to my friends, they fed this desire in my heart that, okay, I deserve what I want. I should be able to go and hang out with my friends. I should be able to, to be free, to do what I want. And this anger welled up inside of me. This sadness coupled with anger, this feeling of loneliness, all this welled up inside of me to the point where I decided that I'm going to get what I want. So I went downstairs. I grabbed the keys. I yelled at my parents and I'm like, hey, I'm leaving. I am getting out of here. I'm going to hang out with my friends. I don't care what you say. And that's when my dad intervened. I stood in front of the door and he's like, there's no way you are leaving this house. We started yelling at each other. And the thing about it, even when I was 17, I was bigger than my dad and I was working out like six days a week because of all the sports teams I was on. And as we were yelling, I do not know what came over me, but in a moment, I grabbed my dad, threw him against the wall, took him off his feet, was yelling in his face. And in a moment of clarity, I asked myself, what am I doing? I froze mid-sentence, let go of him, and in shame and crying, I just went up to my room because I couldn't believe what just took place. Have you experienced that before? You know, in the heat of conflict, you can't even understand the words or the actions that your body is going through as you are fighting with someone. Conflict is a thing we all experience as human beings. If you're a Christian or not in this room this morning, you will experience conflict if you haven't already done so in this life. But here's the question that I want us to contemplate, to ask this morning. What is at the root of the conflict we experience? What is at the heart of those actions that can lead us to violence, be it with our words or our actions? James, starting off this chapter, he asks the same question in a, in a similar way when he says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask. God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Continuing the theme of controlling our mouths and heavenly wisdom versus earthly wisdom, James is now honing in on the heart of the issue, if you will. 
He is saying what is behind the thing that connects all the things that we've just been talking about in chapter 3 and now in chapter 4. And if you're jumping into the series with us this morning, A Beautiful Resistance, we've been going through the book of James, authored by James, the, the little brother of Jesus. And he's writing to this Jewish community of Christian believers that are experiencing division, disunity, dysfunction, conflict at every level. And he's trying to encourage them, rebuke them, and correct them and say, hey, you guys are not acting like Christians. And this is what I want us to get from the get-go this morning. His words, his direct, harsh words are directed at believers this morning. He's talking and writing to Christians, not non-Christians, not people that are exploring Christianity. And if that's you here this morning, welcome. But he's talking to Christians, followers of Jesus. And when it comes to his words this morning, they're direct, they're cutting. Why? Because as Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It's simple. Conflict is not loving one another. James makes it clear that the way that they are behaving is catastrophic to their witness to the watching world around them in their culture. James is pointing out that instead of loving one another, they are killing, they are coveting, they're quarreling, they are fighting. James is first again talking to the teachers, the leader of this community addressing them and their motives behind the way that they're talking, the way that they're talking about favoritism of the rich over the poor. He's addressing them, but then he quickly moves to the whole community because we all have a part to play when it comes to building community. And he's saying, what are you doing? There's division in uh, commentators and interpreters when they come and approach verse two. They're asking the question, like, is there actual killing going on in this community? Some interpret this passage in a way where they're just talking about the words of Jesus, you know, the high standards that he set when he was on this earth uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, where he communicated that being angry with someone is the equivalence of murder in your heart. But even some uh, interpreters say that they're writing about the zealots, right, that Dan talked about last week that have made their way into the community. Zealots being people that might regard murder as a satisfactory means of attaining justice and redistribution of the wealth. They they see that as a way that this can be done. But here's the thing. Whatever the reality we're dealing with, we need to understand that James' main thrust is to get to the bottom of why this is happening. And in the same breath, he gives the answer that applies to every human being in this world, right? Right? Where does conflict come from? He, he answers it. He gives the answer in a rhetorical question when he says, don't they come from the, your desire that battles within you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Right? In the heat of the conflict, that's not the answer that I would give. I'm not sure about you. But when I'm in a fight, right? And if someone was to ask me, like, what's up with the fighting and the quarreling that's going on. The thought that's going through my mind, be it I'm fighting with a family member or my spouse or a friend or a coworker, it's like, it's them. It's the other person, right? The thoughts that are going through my head are like, oh, if they just stopped doing this or if they just did that, right? Or if they just fill in the blank, right? Maybe you have similar thoughts when you're in a fight, right? The problem is, outside of me, not me. But James answers this in a very different way, right? See, because as humans, we love to point to others as the cause of all the drama, the fights, and the conflict we find ourselves in. What we're doing is we're actually just reenacting the scene in Genesis uh, 3 at the beginning of our Bibles when Adam and Eve eat from the fruit of the tree of good and evil, and God comes and approaches Adam, my paraphrase, and says, hey, why did you eat from that tree? And what, how does he answer Does anybody remember? It's that woman. It's that woman that gave me the fruit, right? It's never our faults, right? But James doesn't let us answer the question that way. See, the problem isn't them, it's us. The problem isn't out there, it's in here, my heart, 
the seat of my desires. This shouldn't surprise us, right? James has been building this theme throughout the book as we've been going through it. Back in uh, chapter 1, verse 14, he said that temptation comes from the evil desires in our hearts. In chapter 3, verses 9 to 12, he says that our destructive words, the godless speech that uh, actually reflect the state of our hearts. So it shouldn't surprise us that James, again, is pointing to our hearts. What causes fighting and quarreling amongst us, conflict in community? It's our desires. It's our desires. It's what you want. In the original language, repeated throughout this verse, this passage, is the word desire. Said in different ways, with different connotations, but all meaning the same thing. It's meaning our pleasures, our enjoyment, what we long for. But it's talking about it in a negative way. James simply is making the point that conflict comes into our life when your own selfish desires aren't being met. Again, conflict comes into your life when your own selfish desires aren't being met. Desire is pretty much what you want, and whatever you want will control your actions. Our wants and our longings and desires are at the core of our identity, and our action flows out of that. So again, I ask you this morning, what do you want? PKC, what do you want? Listen, desire is not always a bad thing. Right? If you read the writings of the church fathers, uh, they would acknowledge in the writings that the, there's beauty and goodness with desire that we've had, that we've been given and created to have by God. Desire is a good thing. But they also know and they also write about desire and the ability to it, for it to be bent by sin. Desire can be bent by sin in an inward way where it becomes all about us. And what James is talking about is desire that is bent by sin. Desire that is bent by sin is desiring objects for their own sake. Instead of good desire that leads to experiencing joy in relationship with God and others, we desire to become God and to possess others and to possess the objects we love. Because of the sin that infected all humanity back in the garden, the default setting for all people, if you believe it or not, is to live with themselves at the center. That's the posture of our hearts. And this is what hit me as I read this passage and I was asking God, God, what are you saying to us as a community this week? What are you saying to us as we form community here at Port Kells Church, you know, we're like seven or eight months into this journey. And it's this, PKC, the one thing that will stop us from becoming the community that God wants us to be in the months to come is my desire, is your desire. Getting in the way and superseding what God is doing and what he wants to do here at PKC Church. This is the word for us this morning. This is what's going to get in the way of us forming authentic community. It's when our desire for this building, how it looks, the decorations or whatever it is, how the lobby functions gets in the way of us thinking outside of these walls and to the people that need to be reached with the gospel. It's when our desire for a certain style of music or certain programming or a set list or elements in the service get in the way of what the Spirit is doing in the moment or coming into a Sunday gathering to worship God and to that be our focus. It's when our desire for getting out of service on time or brunch or whatever that thing is that you're going to this afternoon gets in the way of taking time, slowing down, tuning into what the Spirit is doing, praying for the broken, praying for those that need to be healed from sickness, making space to see what the Holy Spirit wants to do, waiting on the Holy Spirit. This morning, here's the question. 
Are we going to put away our wants and our needs and ask this question, God, what do you want? What do you want here at PKC? What do you want here in my life? What do you want to do through me to serve the community around me? See, when reading this passage, right? What we're reading right now is evidence of what happens to a community that doesn't go to God for wisdom. That doesn't ask God, what do you want? It's a prayerless community, right? They're not going to God in prayer because their wants supersede what God wants. So why bother asking? And not only that, they don't pray because they're trying to do it themselves. They're trying to do it in their own ability, with their own strength, with their own effort. That's what pride is, and we're going to get to that in a second. But why? Because of their desire that is bent by sin, the desires in their hearts that are going unchecked. So again, PKC, what do you want? What do you want? When I cannot have what I desire, I often respond with envy. What James calls out earlier in chapter 3 at the end of it before we jump into chapter 4. One author says it like this, Although the 10th commandment, which is do not cover, covet your neighbor's stuff, my paraphrase, even though that's the last commandment, in many ways it is the source of why I so easily break the first nine. And in order to stop this from happening, we have to constantly ask ourselves the question, be aware of our desires, ask ourselves, what do we want? And what is the source that is feeding, that is shaping, that is molding that desire inside your heart? Because left unchecked, left brooding under the surface, it might lead you to do something that you can't believe that you would actually ever do. Just like that moment when I was 17. Because if you like it or not, something is shaping that desire in your heart. For most of us, it's the culture around us that tells us to not inhibit our desires, but to live an uninhibited life, to give in to whatever that desire is in your heart and to follow it wherever it will lead you. But here's the thing, that desire that you have, that you might be acting on with pride because you want what you want, doesn't just lead you into conflict and in the relationships that you find yourselves in, in this world. What James points out very clearly is that it will also lead you into conflict with the God of the universe. That's why he says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. James is not pulling any punches here, is he? See, this word cosmos here that we read as world in the Greek really is the key to understanding what James is saying here. When we read world, what James means is world meaning the values of the world, the systems of the world, the forces and elements that are opposed to God. More precisely, the whole complex of human institutions, values, and traditions that knowingly or unwittingly are arrayed against God. That is what James is talking about this morning. James is asking, have you been shaped by those worldly values, those worldly systems, those worldly wisdom? We, when we knowingly or unknowingly allow the world to shape our desires, this is what leads us to conflict, not just with one another, but conflict with God. The community that James is writing to are allowing the desires of the Roman culture that they are living in form what they want, right? We've read about it. They, what, what do they want? What do some of these teachers want? They're looking for status. They're looking for power. They're going after influence. They're letting those values of the world around them bleed into what they see happening in their community. But here's the thing of all our desires, right? No matter what they be, be it for status or riches or for pleasure or for influence, right? At the core of those desires, take status, for instance, as as human beings, we don't just want status. 
We want status for the hope of what status might bring us, which is wholeness, peace, joy. But when we go after those things in a worldly way, John puts it like this in 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. James' equation for us is really simple if you haven't picked it up this morning yet. The values of the world plus you equal enemy of God. It's that simple. In other words, the health of our relationships with God. Remember, he's talking to Christians this morning. The health of a relationship with God is quickly established by examining the desires in our hearts and asking this question. Are they godly? Or are they worldly? Are they godly? Or are they worldly? Selfish hearts are a sign of adulterous hearts. He's talking about spiritual adultery. The conflict between us that shows us we have selfish hearts is also a sign that we have adulterous hearts. Spiritually speaking, we are unfaithful to God. I just want you to pause and let those words hit you. Let that accusation ring out. I'm going to read it again. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. The imagery is powerful. When we read those words, we are to think of the horror of a husband or a wife discovering their spouse in the midst of an affair. James says that such horrendous behavior aptly describes what Christians do when they turn their back on God. This marital language isn't original to James, right? It's the Old Testament language that we find throughout the Old Testament that commonly speaks of God coming to his people as a husband comes to a, his bride. It's language that describes of his people responding in unfaithfulness to him. It's Christians, it's saying that Christians two-time God when we adopt the values of the world. And again, we have to ask ourselves, what do we want? What is the desire at the root of your heart? Here's the beauty of this passage. You know, if you right now, like me, as I was digging into this, feel a little beat up right now, right? Feel a little convicted by the Holy Spirit. If you've answered this question of what do you want honestly, here's the beauty and the hope of the gospel. It comes in with this verse. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he's caused to dwell in us? He being God, he jealously longs for the spirit he's caused to dwell in us. This is a difficult passage to translate, but the gist of it that I want us to understand and get to this morning is this. God's desire for us trumps our desire that leads us to sin. God's desire for us trumps our desire that leads us to be his enemy. God's desire for us trumps our desire that leads us to be unfaithful to him. PKC, hear this. He longs for you. Even if you're wondering, if he, even if you're far away from God in this moment, he longs to be in relationship with you. This is a good desire. This good desire created by God before sin tarnished it is desire that longs for beauty and goodness, for biblical justice, for putting all things right. It's a desire we long for uh, that we long for in a world that is broken with relationships. Broken relationships when it comes to people of the other gender or ethnicity or political party, as well as the material world. That, and it's this want and desire that we want everything to be governed not only by God, but by kindness and honesty. It's to want what God wants to desire what God desires, to hunger and thirst after God and crave a world where he is all in all. Uh, a vision that is summed up in this statement, the kingdom of God. That's the good desire that's implanted in all of us to want what God wants, to want the kingdom of God. God's desire is to see this happen. 
God's longing for us is to put things right, to put us back into a proper relationship with him. And this is, what J- this is why James adds this verse, that my favorite verse in this whole passage. But he gives us more grace. He gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Friends, this morning, there is more grace. There's abundant grace. Grace, it, grace is getting what you don't deserve. As one author put it, I, lo- I love this. Grace is love without contingencies. The gift of grace is that he gives us everything we need to fulfill the demand of loyalty to him that he demands relationally. Get that. In his grace, he gives us everything we need to fulfill the demand of loyalty that he demands when it comes to our relationship with the God of the universe. That is the goodness of God. That is his mercy. That is his faithfulness even when we're unfaithful. That is who God is. That is his character. It's by his grace that we can put away our pride. Pride being the mindset that our needs, our desires are put in front and before the community or anybody else that we're in relationship with. That's what pride is. But he gives us the grace to put that aside, to humble ourselves. Humility being, as uh, Tim Keller said, not thinking more of myself, as modern culture says, or thinking less of myself, as traditional culture says, but simply humility being thinking of myself less. Is that not what Jesus did? Right? When he walked this earth, is is that not what he modeled for us when he walked this earth, lived a perfect life, went to the cross, died a perfect death, and rose from the dead? See, when we read, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you, come near to God and he will come near to you, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, grieve, mourn, and wail, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. James is trying to do a couple things here. First, he's communicating to us 10 commandments, if you notice that. 10 commands that we need to, 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 to uh, act on right away. There's immediacy to his language. And these are the commands. He's submit. He says resist, come near, wash, purify, grieve, mourn, wail, change, humble. To the original leaders, readers, they would have understood this. But the second thing James is trying to do, he's trying to evoke in their imagination this temple imagery. This imagery that would be so evident and familiar to this Jewish culture that he's talking to. See, they lived in this culture where when it comes to washing hands, they would have thought of the holy water that you washed your hands with, that the priest would use to consecrate themselves before they offered a sin offering for the people of the community. Before they went into the Holy of Holies and slaughtered uh, this lamb that would be all the sins of the community piled onto this lamb that they would slaughter as a sacrifice that was demanded by God, right? Because the wages of sin is death. But not only that, in his language, James is pointing to the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, who submitted his will to the Father, who resisted the devil when he walked this earth, who who purifies our sins by his blood that he shed on the cross for us. See, we grieve, we wail, we mourn over our sinful desires because it's our sin that put him there. It's our sin that put him on the cross. Jesus is why God can offer us more grace. Jesus is why God loves us without contingencies. Jesus is indeed our mediator. He's the final mediator that we've ever needed. He's the final mediation. We need to realize this. God does get angry, as one author says, because he hates sin. 
because it violates his character and robs him of what he wants most, what he loves most, and that's you. But understanding the Trinity, understanding that God doesn't compete with himself, the gentle son is not pleading with an angry father, but he's presenting to us the heart of the father who loves us despite ourselves. That's what we see when we look at Jesus on the cross, the heart of the father that loves us despite ourselves. The process that James is describing without using this word is the the process of repentance. Verses 7 to 10, that is what he's describing. He's describing the process of repentance. When we repent of our sins and ask Jesus for forgiveness. But the forgiveness that Jesus gives us is more than just mere pardon. I want you to get that this morning. It's not just mere pardon, but it's also his acceptance of us as his beloved in spite of us. We don't just experience forgiveness, we experience also the God who forgives. That's the invitation when he says, come near. It's to experience the heart of a father. When I was uh, in my early 20s, I struggled a lot with debt, with managing money. And then there's this one point where I worked my way into about 17 uh, K worth of debt. And it wasn't good debt. It wasn't because I put a down payment on a house or bought a car or anything like that. It was just because I decided not to uh, limit my desires and just buy whatever I wanted. And I got to this point where I knew that I didn't have the ability by working the job that I was working to pay back this debt. I knew that there was no way that I was going to be able to, to pay the next month's credit card bill. And so this is what happened. I knew that I needed to humble myself, that I needed to ask for help. I needed to put my pride aside. So I called up my dad and I was like, hey, dad, can I talk to you and mom uh, tomorrow evening? So he said, like, sure, come on, come on over. So late evening, I, I walked into the living room of my parents' house. I sat down on the couch on the other side of them. And I started just telling them, started just confessing the mistakes that I made, the ways that I misused money, the wrong decisions that I made in the last couple months that led me to this place of debt. And the funny thing about it is, as I was, I was somewhat confessing these mistakes, tears just started streaming down my face. I didn't quite understand in that moment what was going on. It was repentance taking place in my heart. It was the confession of my wrongdoing. And here's the beauty of it. Before I even finished my last sentence, my dad interrupted me and he said, Ben, we love you. Don't worry, I'll I'll pay your debt. (laughs) And here's the thing. I knew my dad was ready to pay my debt the moment I opened up my mouth and told him what was going on. There was no hesitation in his voice. There was no, hey, you have to do this before I pay your debt, before I forgive your mistakes. That is just a small glimpse of the heart of your heavenly father. Jesus said it like this when he was talking to his disciples. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your heavenly father know how to give good gifts to you? This morning, PKC, the promise that you can bank on, the invitation to you this morning that James puts in front of you is come near to God so that he will come near to you. 
If you find that your desires do not align with the desires of the kingdom of God or the desires of God, come near to God because he will come near to you. That is a promise that you can bank on. There's no hesitation when it comes to how God approaches you. It comes to the unconditional love that he wants to lavish on you. He's already come near to you. We know this because he traveled across the universe in the person of Jesus to die for your sins, to die for that mistake. There's no hesitation. Your sin is paid for, past, present, and future. He wants to transform those desires. He wants to align them with his, to use them as a catalyst to move you to join him in the renewal of the world and what he is already doing. You could bank on that promise. Jesus died for the sins of the world, but the reality of your sins being forgiven, your slate being wiped clean, the ability to have a fresh start can only be an applied reality to your life if you first submit. The first step to coming near to God is surrender. Remember, he is talking to Christians. We're not talking about conversion. We're talking about something, a practice that we need to do daily in our lives to make sure that our desires are aligning with the desires of the Father. We need to submit. We need to give him those desires. We need to trust him knowing that he's a good father and he knows what we want, but he knows what is best for us also. He knows what he's created us to accomplish on this earth. See, in our culture, we don't like this word submission. We don't like this word for good reasons because of the abuse of power and leadership that we see all around us in the world, in the church and outside of the church around us. The way that influence is abused, authority is abused. But here's the thing when it comes to submission. You don't really have a choice. See, the enemy knows this. And that's why he tries to deceive us by thinking submission is a bad thing. But here's the reality of the situation. You're either living in submission to the desires of your heart that will lead you into conflict with the people around you and the God of the universe, or you live in submission to your good, faithful heavenly father that's the choice that you're left with it's your choice so this morning here's the question what do you want here's the choice will you submit what you want to God this morning Or will you live the rest of your life in submission to the desires of your heart? Let's pray.